Good morning, New Beginnings Church of Life family. We're so glad that you're here. Now, let's prepare our hearts, minds, and bodies to worship Jesus together. Hear the Word of God and continue to give generously with great joy. Something that you normally do 
forget the night before. Right? Because there's a lot of peeling and digging. There's, there's the other getting word and getting their understanding of a different language and getting the context right and getting the text right and getting it so I can make it up and we can make it applicable to the people of God. There's a lot of work that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Not even including making sure you spend time with the Lord so you will, your heart will be right as you speak the word of God. So for those of you who are this is if you desire to be a preacher, know it's a lot of hard work a lot most of the time. Mm -hmm. What you get a lot of times from here is the finished product. And, and a person ministering often is not happy with the finished product. <laughs> but the thing is, we know we must plead. We're looking to plead God, right? So what, why am I sharing all this with you? Because God wants us to trust him. And sometimes God goes a different way than we expect. God takes us through a different path than he's taken us before. So, so why am I? Because usually, as I already said, my sermon or how God has used me and ministered with me is there's a certain process. I could get a word doing, doing praise and worship, and I say, okay, next time I preach, I think that's what I'm going to preach on. Or even if somebody asks me to preach, and they come to me immediately, I'm speaking on this. But this time, God just took me, and I'm putting... And nothing clicked. Nothing clicked even like the late last night, one o'clock. But it was still this. Because I went with this, I went away from it, I went back to it, I went away from it. And I'll be honest with you, even sitting here, I was contemplating do I preach what I've typed or what the scribble I got written <laughs> on my paper? And then I just came to the conclusion, God, you're not the author of confusion. No, you're not. You know what your people need to hear. Both can work, but only one needs to be spoken at this time to your people. So we talk about trust in God. Yeah. Amen. So what, what, what does that mean to, to trust and, 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 and a firm belief in the reliability, the truth, Ability and the strength of someone, when I'm going to replace that someone, of God. Right? A firm, that's a big thing. A firm or a strong belief in the reliability, the truth, the ability, and the strength of God. A firm belief in all of that. So, what that means, I must have an understanding of the character of God, the ability. Ability of God, the sovereignty of God, all of that plus more. But here's the question after I got that this morning and I wrote down, I wrote this down, is trusting God easy? Hmm. Is trusting God easy? Now don't answer too quick. We say, we say, we see, we say it should be easy. But it often depends on where we are in our life and what we're going through. And we can say, I know I'm supposed to, but I'm struggling. I know what, what, what I'm, I should be doing. Man, it's, all I can see is this mess here. I know what I'm what I'm, I, I know what I'm struggling with. I got this habit in my life, and I know what I'm struggling with, and I should trust God with this. But I'm struggling. So here, here, here are three things I wrote down. And, and see, we, we get happy about the first two. God had a purpose for you. God had a plan for you. We love, we love that. And we, because we have an understanding that if God has a plan for us, that means he wants to use us. He has a purpose for it. He wants us to accomplish something in his kingdom. And, and, and we're happy. We're, we're glad about that. But there's a third one that I think we probably struggle with. And that is God has a process. And the process is how God makes us and shapes us to accomplish his plan and his purpose. You hear what I'm saying? So in other words, often we got to go through things and through some hard times 
in order for God's plan to be accomplished and its purpose be accomplished in our lives and in the lives of others, right? So that means sometimes I go through years of working on a certain job, but God is Start planning and, and, and making me in this place so he can use me here, which means I put up with a lot of stuff here and I may not like it. And see, here's the thing I may not see what's really going on until God moves me. And then I can look back and say, That's why. That's why I went through what I went through. That's why I, 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 I had to go through all that stuff in this place because of this. Now, it's the process that really catches us off guard because God puts us and, and, and takes us to a really hard time sometimes in order to make us, in order to accomplish his purpose in our lives. So we must get out of our mind that trusting God means that whatever I want, God's going to give me. And everything's going to work out great in my life. God causes it to rain on the just and the unjust. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's the book, right? Yes. He causes it to rain, which means I'm going to go through hard times just like the person that's not saved. But what I must understand is that what God is doing in my life as a believer, He's actually working out something in my life to for His purpose. Now, here's the thing that we must understand. All the time. The ultimate goal and God taking us through the hard times and the hardships of life, God has an ultimate goal for each and every one of us that are believers, and that is to conform you and I to the image of his son Jesus Christ. That's right. That, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Is that he's trying to make us more Christ-like. And, and so we got you you and I are not gonna go through this life without test. That's right. We're not going to go through life without test. We're going to, if we belong to God, there's a, you know, there, for me, and for most of us, there's not only a process after salvation, there was a process before salvation. Yeah. Amen. And, and what do I mean by that? If, if we're honest, we actually look at our lives as God is working. I can see God's hand in my life yeah. working in my life before I surrender my life unto him. I see, I can see, now I can look back and just see God working things and how he did something to my life and how he worked and allowed something to happen till I came to a point where he's revealing himself to me and my heart, I just surrendered to him. Amen. So I can see him working in the process of my life that God is going to work in each and every one of our lives. Now listen to this. I said it, everything's not going to go the way we plan or want it to. We're going to have some trouble. Jesus told the disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. But then he goes on to say, be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the trouble. He, if we overcome the trouble, he didn't say you're not going to still be in trouble, but I've overcome the world. Here's the other piece that I think we, I know I struggle with. God is not obligated to tell me why. I know sometimes we've been told, we're not been told, we've been preached to sometimes. I'm not saying here, but we can make God do what we want him to do. We can make God tell God what we want. God is sovereign. A sovereign being is answerable, answerable only to himself. He's not answered. He doesn't answer to any one of them. How can the thing that's created say to the being that created it, why did you do such and such? Now, I'm not saying, I won't tell you that you can't, you should, you can't ask God why. What I am telling you is God is not obligated to answer your question. As you're going through, listen, in the book of Job, hmm. God's talking. Now, look, think about the book of Job. In the book of Job, Job is unaware of the conversation that's going on in heaven, right. number one. Read that first chapter. Job is unaware of the conversation between God and Satan. Unaware of it. 
Job is unaware that God brings his name up to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? Yes. Mm -hmm. See, this is the providence and the behind the scenes stuff sometimes that God is doing. We, we may not even be aware of it. Have you considered my servant Job? That's right. Well, yeah, but you got to head your the Lord. So in other words, you know what's going on. And, and here is the ultimate argument the enemy was making. If you take everything away from him, he will not worship. That's really the whole thing. That's the whole gist of it for the enemy is that if you take all this stuff away, you won't. So listen, God says you can have at it. Yeah. But you can only go so far. You can't touch it. And through all of Job's talking and through all the talking of his friends, through all the conversations that they were having, I don't know why I'm going through this. Your friend's telling you you're going through this because you must have done something wrong. And, and listen, every, everything we go through is not because we did something wrong. That's right. right. That's right. You, you, we must understand. Yeah, there's something we know where we messed up and, and, and this is the price we pay. But everything we go through is not because, you, because you're going through a hard time. does not mean it's because you did something wrong. That's right. But here's Job, and he's lost everything. Even his own wife is basically kicking him in the teeth, talking about you need to curse God. Mm -hmm. And he's talking, and he's talking. You know, I don't know why I was this way. When I had my money, I was this way. People bowed to me. All of this. There's some of you guys that would even talk to your father. You know, Job said some stuff. But the scripture also said that Job never lost his integrity. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So in all of this, after all that Job went through, you know what you never find? Where God explained to Job why he allowed to happen what happened. That's right. And so I said all of that to tell you that God is not obligated to share with you and I why you're going through what you're going through. Mm -hmm. What I am obligated to do is just trust God in the midst of what I'm going through. We trust God in the midst of the process. So 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 we, we must understand the process in the book of Daniel, I think it is, uh, the three Hebrew, Hebrew boys. The process is the king sets up a statue, the king sets up music, the king sets up all this stuff and said, when everybody hears the music, everybody's got a bow. And worship the golden image that I have created. Everybody, I believe it's in Daniel chapter 3. Everybody must bow to this image. And the three boys did not bow. Right. Now they're in the spotlight. Right? Somebody went and told on them all out of all these people, these three guys are in the spotlight. And, and the thing about it is they knew what the, the, the cause of their disobedience to the king would bring to them. So what am I saying? You and I must understand that sometimes our obedience to God will cost us. Yes. And it's going to take us into some places. See, just because I obey God doesn't mean the path is always going to be smooth. That's right. And they chose, they said, listen, they said, our God is able to deliver us. The first thing I would tell each and every one of us is, Strengthen our personal relationship with Christ. That's right. Strengthen our relationship with God. Because see, when the hard times come, you got to be able to brag on God sometime. And they said, listen, God is able to deliver us. But now you have to talk, and, and I think you were reading in Revelation, sometimes you got to have an eternal view of things. Because and they said, what's the eternal view? Eternal view. Even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow. The eternal view says that I win either way. Right? The eternal view Paul talked about is just really, if I look at things on this earth, it is just a light affliction when it's just for a moment, which is working for me a far exceeding and more eternal weight of glory. 
right? So when he's talking about we're crushed and, and, and we're not in despair, he's talking about we're beat down, but we're not, you know, we're, we're, we're going through, the believer goes through, the believer suffers, but on the other side of that, the believer has this eternal hope that no matter what, I don't lose because if I, if I, if I lose my life here, I'm in the presence of the Lord. But if I stay and, and God brings me through this thing, God still gets glorified in the midst of my life. Amen. Amen. And so the three Hebrew boys said, we're not bowing. So we got to make our relationship, this relationship is personal. Now here's the thing. In a relationship, trust is vital. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Whether it's husband and wife, whether it's parents and children, trust is vital. Mm -hmm. If a parent don't trust a kid, that they're a dog kid, that that whatever, a lot of times we can only go so far in the house. I don't trust you. And that, and you know what? That's a hurtful thing both ways. Amen. Amen. That's a hurtful thing. A husband and wife, but on that earth, that's why no title there should be no title relationship. But if the trust isn't there, if the trust has been broken, it's hard sometimes to make that thing work again. And see, what we have a lot of time, people just stand together, but people that are not trusting each other. And that's not a relationship. You got you, you, you may be married, but you're just cohabitating. You're not because relationship requires a true relationship with trust requires intimacy. Mm -hmm. And intimacy requires communication. And communication requires me taking time to listen and to talk. To listen and to talk. And what I, why am I saying all of that? Because our relationship with Christ requires us to listen to him and talk to him. In order for the intimacy to deepen, I must choose, I must choose to spend time with him. See, it, see the depth of my relationship with Christ is not on Christ. Sorry. It's on me. So I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm talking about the strength and the depth of our relationship with him. It depends on you and I. How, 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 how strong it is depends on you. How much time are you willing to spend with him? Or are you willing to spend any time? See, any time there's a relationship and there's two people, there's a cause for sacrifice. Mm-hmm. There's a cause for somewhere I got to sacrifice some atoning in order to spend time with God, in order to get the mind of God and to see what he wants. That's spend time in his word, spend time in prayer, spend time in contemplation on him. But it requires that in order for intimacy in the relationship and to strengthen me. Therefore, when I'm going through, I know I can count on him. And it's the same thing in a marriage covenant, right? I know I can count on her. I can count on him. I'm going through. I know that they're going to be there with me. I don't have to worry about, are they really here? Are they really on my side? I don't have to worry about that because we have gone through some stuff already. And there's a realization that he knows how to stand and hold his ground and be there with me. I know I can lean on him, and I can lean on his shoulder, and, and if I have to cry and he holds me, he'll do that. I can trust that we built something together. It's the same thing with Christ. It's the same thing with Christ, only more important. Because in spite of how tight our marriages are, our spouse is going to disappoint us. It's really quiet. <laughs> but they're human. You're human. They're going to disappoint us. But somehow we pick up the pieces and we keep moving, right? Let me tell you something Christ is never going to disappoint you. But you're going to disappoint him. It's true. But he picks up the pieces. And we keep going. He keeps telling us and showing us that he loves us and telling us, listen, I died for you. I died for this disappointment. Come on, stand up. Let's keep going forward. Amen. 
I die for you. You're going to get through this process. And, and, and see, here's the thing I think that we, 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 we get so caught up often and we hear so many messages about the outcome of things. See, they three Hebrew boys, you know, everybody is glad that, you know, they came out of the fire, but nobody wants to really say, man, they were in this furnace. That's right. They were in a furnace. And, and, and so often we're looking for God to, to deliver us before the heat hit, but God all of a sudden allowed us to go into the heat. What then? And sometimes we fall apart because we say, I can't believe God, that you would allow this to happen. Why not? He's God and I'm not. He knows what he's doing. He, he, God knows what's best for me. Yeah. And God's not going to come and ask me, do you want to go through this? We're looking for God to say, God, you see this furnace. You heard this man say they turned it up. Seven times hotter. Lord, you even saw some of these guys that are dying, trying to throw us in. Lord, do we have to go through? But they never, listen. I said it all the way, sometimes we don't have a choice. We're just going to go through. Right? In the book of Mark, chapter 6, Jesus feeds 5,000. And as he's done with that, he constrained when he gets the disciples, tells them to get in a boat and go to the other side. He said, I'm sending the people away, and he goes and prays. And the Bible did go on to say that at a certain time, Jesus saw them out in the water, and they were toiling because the wind had come up, and they were struggling. So let's think about this. Jesus sent the disciples out there. And they obeyed him. Why would Jesus send them into a place where he knew a storm was going to come up? Hmm. And so often I think we're looking for God to take us around things. And so often God is taking us through stuff. And a lot of times it's to make and prune us which is what we need because we have too much of self still in our life and God and part of it is the sanctification project. But he has taken a, he allowed God, Jesus sent those men out there into a storm. It wasn't a storm when they left, but somewhere along the way, the wind came up. The wind came up and they're toiling and they're struggling. And Jesus saw them. But here's the thing you want to grab a hold of. <coughs> Scripture said it. Jesus didn't get out of the boat. He came off the land, started walking on the waves, and started walking toward them. And the scripture declared, I think it may not be in Mark, but in the, uh, some of the other gospels, that he would have or could have passed them by. They thought it was a spirit. And he said, Hold on, it's me. This thing I can guarantee that Christ will show up in the chaos of your life. Right. Here it is, chaotic for them, right? We're struggling with this storm, and and, and, it, and here's the thing: they're experienced fishermen. They're experienced fishermen. They've dealt with it, but see, here's the thing: sometimes some of the things that we dealt with can still be overwhelming. And we need Christ to manifest himself in the midst of our chaos. That's right. Stop trying to figure it out yourself. Stop trying to work it out yourself. Ask God into the situation. And now listen. Because here's the thing. Jesus stepped in the boat and the wind died. This is what I want us to grab a hold of. Jesus Christ can step into the middle of our situation in the middle of our chaos, and it's not so much if the wind died as much as if he gives me peace in the midst of all that's going on. Right? A peace that passes all understanding in the midst of all that's going on. True story. Years ago, I was going through a real rough time with my ex-wife, and I'm hearing all these voices coming at me. I mean, people just. 
went in my living room one night, late night, early morning, and I just got on my knees and said, God, it's too much. Too many voices, too many people saying stuff, too many people giving advice. And at that moment, and I hadn't prayed long, I felt his presence and a peace that settled me right down. Did the voices stop? No. The people stop offering their advice? No. We don't do that. Everybody wants to help out. <laughs> but God gave me a peace in the midst of all that was going on. And sometimes that's all we need because we know what's going on and how much stuff that we go through is God is process, taking us through the process of making us is stuff that we can't control. And we're trying to. Right? Listen to this. Abraham, get out of your land. I'm going to show you a land that's going to be yours and your descendants. You're 75 years old, but you don't have any kids. Interesting. Twenty as he goes through, I'm getting older and older. God keeps making the same promise. I'm going through some stuff. Me, me and my wife come up. Well, my wife comes up with a plan, and I'm down with it. She gives me her servant. Okay, still not part of the plan. God will bring you and I to the very end of ourselves before He works in our lives. Yes. He will bring us to the place where our own human strength is of no good when he can work in you and our lives. So this is why there's a firm belief in the strength and reliability of someone. I have to be able to understand the ability of God, but also the faithfulness of God. God is faithful to his word. Amen. Amen. And I've shared it with you before. God often, sometimes he tells people in the Bible where he planned on taking them, but he never tells them the process. David, you're anointed king. You don't get to know what the process is. Joseph. Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. You don't get to know the process. And on top of that, you're not really going to see the fruition of what I'm saying to you. Right. That's right. All you're going to see is this child of promise, which is Isaac, and you'll see a whole bunch of other kids that I'm going to give to you after you have Isaac. But the promise is in Isaac. Isaac, you are not going to really see the promise. Jacob, you're not really going to see the promise, but I'm promising it to you. And so each one saw a little bit more, right? Jacob went down into Egypt, but God had told Abraham that his seed would go to Egypt and spend 400 odd years, and then I'm going to bring them out. But God didn't tell him the process, right? He didn't tell him that they were going to go into bondage. Sorry. Sorry. And then he was going to bring them out. He was going to bring them out in full health and all of this stuff. He was going to make it the captors, uh, give them the goods of the house, to give them the gold and silver and all this stuff so they could build a tabernacle to the Lord and all that. He didn't tell them all the struggle that they were going to go through. And I want each and every one of us to, other, us to understand that God is not going to tell you the struggle that you're going to have to go through, but God wants you to trust him. That's right. And my guarantee to you today is God not only will show up, God knows about it. That's right. God knows where each and every one of us are. He knows the tears that we have shed over some of our circumstances. He knows about it. And when he shows up, see, some of us have been in a place where we shed tears, and God showed up, and God basically just dried our eyes. Through his presence and through a word, he, he, he gave us a peace that passed all understanding. We might have some children that are out there and we don't know. But what has God promised concerning that child? See, do you know if God has promised and told you that he's going to save that person, he's going to do it. Often our problem is 
we want our kids just to grow up in church and get saved and not go through any of the hardships. Not to fall off. We, we don't want that. Number one, because we see it. Number two, some of it we lived it. And we don't want our kids to go through it. But the thing is, and the older I get, the more I think about this. What would I like at 25? <laughs> I had a job, I had my car, I had my own place. But I was a knucklehead. <laughs> and, what, and what do I mean by that? I grew up in the church. See, growing up in the church, it doesn't guarantee salvation. And we got to get that out of our head. We need to teach our kids, listen, you need to have a personal relationship with the Lord. It's not enough just to show up. And then, if they decide to walk away, but God has given you a promise, let God work in their lives. Love them, and let God work in their lives. Stop trying to make them get saved. That ain't your job. I don't know who I'm talking to. <laughs> But it's not, to, it's not our job to make people get saved. And you know what our job is? It's to portray Christ in front of people. And part of that is loving people right where they are. So you know one of the things, as much as, see, I respected my parents enough not to do any of my dirt or bring any of my dirt to their house, but not enough not to do it when I was on my own. But you know what? My folks never, I would, the house was always open. They always loved me. Every once in a while, mom would say something. Dad didn't say too much. Mom said something. I'll give you an example. I may have shared this. I on my second car was a Honda Prelude. And it was a nice standard. It was a sports car. I'm single now at this point. And it's a nice car. I show up one Sunday to church just to show my folks my new. And my mom makes a statement, you ought to give thanks to God for this car. And I said, what for? And she said, because God gave me this car. Now I think about it, she was right, because my credit was jacked up. <laughs> I still don't, to this day, I, now the guy that helped me was, was my college roommate, and he really worked, but still, I probably should have got the car. I said, what for? God gave me this car. I was extremely dismissive behind that. Find out two years later, things started going wrong in my life. I mean, they were already kind of off, but they were starting. <coughs> I called my mom one day and asked her for something. It was a money issue. And she said, you know, Tony, when you were going to church, you weren't having this money problem. Kind of light went off. I started listening to you know certain people on TV. I started showing up to church. Still haven't yielded. No he's pulling at me. Still haven't yielded. I'm having problems making payment with the car. One Thursday morning I wake up. Be bold. Now the guy had called me the day before. I said, Mr. Grant, we need you to come in by five o'clock and do this. And I said, or oh, what? He said, don't worry about all what. I knew right then. That was a Wednesday night. I went to prayer meeting. We had a prayer meeting on Wednesday night, and I'm on my knee begging God. Don't let him take my car. <laughs> And, you know, it was years later I thought about what I said to my mom. But what I realized is God was using the thing that I had put so much pride in and so much of myself in to help break me. And to, I found myself begging for the car, going from begging for my car to yielding my life to Christ. All in an hour prayer meeting. Now, I had been coming before then. But see, and what I want us to understand is God will use whatever it takes to get you and I to wherever we need to be. So I don't want us to begrudge the process, no matter how hard it is. Is it easy? 
No. So what, what, what are the things that we need to do before I sit down? If you're struggling in a place and you just don't get it and you don't understand it, that, that's okay. But check God's credential. Right? If you've been saved any length of time, go over your history with God. Where, where, where things have been rough and what God has done. And, and if that's not good enough, look in the Word of God and see what He's done for those that He's called. And, and a lot of men He called messed up. David messed up. But God was faithful to him. Hmm. Right? Abraham lied. But God was faithful to him. Right? Listen, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's going to be faithful to you. No matter how jacked up my life may get it. No matter how many, whatever I do wrong, he promised me, I'm not going to leave you no forsake. Now, by the same token, if I'm messing up, he also promised I'm going to, I'm going to chastise you. So, 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 so let's be careful that part of my process might be chastisement, and you just got to endure that like a hardy soldier and keep it moving. <laughs> the woman ain't going to last a long time. <laughs> but in most cases, We'll straighten up after that. So check God's credentials. What is, what is God? What is God like? Has God been faithful to His word? Ha, ha, can I find a place where God has ever lied or His word had to come true? Ha, ha, can I find a place where God has just turned His back on those that He has called and chosen for Himself? And, and if I can't do that, then I just need to get in the Word and dig and just stand on the promises of God. The second thing I would say is just trust Him day by day. Stop trying to trust God for a month when it's only Tuesday and it's the second. Mm -hmm. Just trust Him. Enough is sufficient for the day that you're in. Just trust Him to get you through this day and to get you through whatever you're dealing with and to give you the peace and the strength to go through whatever you're going through for that day. That's right. Secondly, thirdly, rely on God's strength. Stop trying to be strong yourself and let go and just lean in. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Know this. In the book of 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, I think verses 8 to 11, Paul is talking and he says, we were pressed so hard, we thought that we were, I'm paraphrasing now, we thought that we were going to die we thought there was a death sentence on it, and, and, and it was a struggle for it. And, and he said, this was, I think when we were in Asia, he said, and I, we were going through, and things were tough, and we thought that it was a death sentence. We thought we were going to die. This is what he thought. He said, this is how hard things had gotten for him. And this is the Apostle Paul. He said, things were hard, and we thought we were going to die. But then he makes a statement. He said, we went. this was the reason why we went through it. So that we would know to rely on God and not on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is trying to do in you and our lives. To get us to a point where we rely on Him and not on ourselves. Can I say this? As strong as you are, you're not as strong as you think you are. That's right. I'm not as strong as I think I am. That's right. I need to lean in on God and trust God. God to bring about the outcome that he wants. Not that I want, what he wants. See, in that same book, Paul talks about, I'm trying to quit, but in that same book, he talks about uh, 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 he knew a man, he was boasting, and he said, I knew a man 14 years ago who, 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 who who was taken to the third heaven, whether it was in the body or out of the body, he was taken up into the heaven, and he saw things that were unlawful. He heard things that were unlawful. He said that the revelation was great. He said, because of the amount of revelation that had been given to me, so that I would not go and become conceited in my own self, there was sent unto me a messenger of Satan to buffet my body. In other words, to give me a hard time, there was something. And I saw the Lord three times, and I heard a man say, Paul had three seasons of prayer concerning this issue. But the word that came to Paul was, my grace is sufficient. 
And Paul goes on to say, therefore I will glory in my weaknesses. Why? So that God or Christ can be more prominent in my life. I'm leaning on his strength and not my strength. I will glory in, in, in all the hard times, the beating, the, the, the shaming, the, the insult, and all of this. Why? So that Christ can be glorified in my life. When I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because it's not my strength, it is Christ's strength. So somewhere along the way, Paul was going through something, and he realized God's not taking this away because he tells me it's great, it's sufficient. Okay, I got to go on and keep doing what God has called me to do, which was to minister to people. So you and I, wherever we are, whatever we're dealing with, here's the thing. You got to go on doing what God has called you to do. That's right. right. You and I have to keep doing what God has called you and I to do. And God will work it out. Now, if you believe in God, it's going to take care of you. And God is going to bring you up. And he can and will. I want to leave you with the 27th Psalm. What David says, what the psalmist says, I'm just reading, looking at the last two verses there. I think that's the Lord is my light and my salvation. So I fear. But in the last few verses, he said, I would have fainted. I would have given up. I would have thrown in the towel. I would have just threw my hand up if I had not believed and seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Mm -hmm. I would have given up. So, what am I telling you? Don't give up. That's right. Don't give up. He's saying, I, I, I expect to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, don't get the goodness of the Lord tied up or mixed up with what you want to happen. What I want to happen. Let's get it mixed up right with what God is actually doing in my life. And he's going to, is he going to do it, how he's going to bring me out. But then he goes a little further. He said, wait on the Lord and be of good cheer or be of good courage. Wait, I say, on the Lord. The process requires Patience. Okay? The process requires patience. A good cake cannot be made in 15 minutes. Not if you want me to eat it. <laughs> I'll say good job, but no thank you. A good meal a great meal takes time and patience. My mom told me this a long time ago. She said cooking requires, good cooking requires patience. You also got to enjoy it because that helps with the patience piece. And so you can take your time and do everything that you're supposed to. Listen, God is taking his time with you and I. You and I cannot rush the Lord in the process. You hear what I'm saying? You can't rush him. So that's why the psalm said, wait on the Lord. Wait, I say on the Lord. He's going to bring it about. Just gotta, we got to be patient. Remember this. God had a purpose. God had a plan. And God had a process. And they all work together. I just talked about the process today. Because we get so excited about the purpose and the plan of God. And I think what happens sometimes is we get caught up in the process and we say, God, I thought the purpose for me was for this. And his purpose had to change. He just didn't tell me what you have to go through for his purpose to be accomplished. Amen. So for you and I, I just want to say this. Wait on the Lord. Patient, God will see you through this. Wherever you are, God, listen, God will see you through. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to go to mbcol-ny.com to connect with us. Or you can find us on Facebook and YouTube. Leave a comment, subscribe, and follow us. We would love to hear from you.